Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Bannon or ASB Prime here, the site super moderator for Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com and the main host of the Avatar Online podcast. And I'm here back again to present to you the um, episode commentary for episode 3 of The Legend of Korra, K103 The Revelation. Now where this commentary is going to like start from is it's going to include the opening, so opening uh, of the show, so basically the earth, water, fire, air bit of the show, so that's where you want to like get your episode uh, ready to go from, The when that starts, that's when the commentary is going to start, so um, I'm just going to pause here for a second, and then when I speak, next time I speak is going to be straight into the commentary, so press play, that's when I'm going to press play, I'm going to pause now. Okay, so here's the commentary for K103, The Revelation, the third episode of, Le of The Legend of Korra. The first two episodes were very much the introduction episodes for kind of our heroes. In this episode, we really get the, in at the end, the introduction of um, Amon and the Equalus and what they're about. And also in this episode, we get the, the kind of real first um, look at um, Makora, the relationship. Um, you know, they were both kind of staring longingly at where each other lived at the end of the last episode, but here we see the, their interactions together in this episode. It's um, interesting, and it, it re you really see how the relationship uh, gets from here to, like, obviously where it is at the end of um, episode 12. And, um, obviously, they're all on the pro bending team. Cora's got her gear now. You know, she's really much a part of the team now she's no longer the kind of she's no longer the kind of <laughs> noob at uh, pro bending in terms of she knows how to do, what to do she's going to training now because she knows she's going to be in future matches and then we're in and then here's Butaka the guy with an amazing name that sounds amazing especially the way he says it Butaka yeah and um yeah, it's, it's interesting that this is the only sound time we see him in the whole show. Um, with the kind of focus in the first half of this uh, book on pro bending, it's weird that we only see him this kind of one time. And we see the amount of uh, yuans that um, the firefighters win, but that they have to spend then on like stuff, like gear. And then, just out of nowhere, they're they're going to drop with this thing, their first time qualifying for the tournament, and they have to find some, somehow find a way to get 30,000 yuans. It's just like, wow. And then here's an interesting uh, thing that Cora says here. She's always had people taking care of her, and that's kind of both the kind of a uh, good thing about her, kind of a, like a uh, growing up and the kind of bad thing for her yes she had like people looking after her. she never really had to do much stuff herself but at the same time she hasn't had much freedom and she was pretty much contained in that campaign but when she says that to Mako and Bolin who obviously their parents uh, were killed by firebenders they were growing up on the streets as orphans you know it's a uh, you understand why they're kind of uh, sad saddened by this and Mako's a bit angry about it and even just that line there from uh, Mako, I I'll find so something to do. I always do. Bolin, eager to prove himself to his brother. And um, it's kind of something we're probably going to see more from Bolin in going into book two. We've kind of had that confirmed. But um, we see him definitely grow a, a lot of the characters from like these early episodes to the final episodes. He is a lot... Um, you see, the big change is obviously Bolin from this episode to what he does in the fin finale, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. Some uh, interesting things to note here. That Pavu does a kind of dance on the street wearing a costume, just like uh, Momo does uh, in The Tale of Momo. Sh Shady Shane, and we get some of the uh, the like triad names, and the hell I have like a... <laughs> I like the way he like, just... It's fine with that. This is his name. His Shady is his first name. Shane is his second name. It's like who gave him that? <laughs> yeah, but we see, we see um, something that's not really touched on that much in the kind of whole show here, and really that the triads do actually kind of fight each other, and um, really it's only mentioned in this episode um, that the triads are actually fighting each other. We know that they 
like um, are bad in the city, but against each other we haven't really seen that much of it. And uh, th the fact that they're like muscling up or something here that we never really see is a bit interesting. And hopefully with Mako as a cop in book two, we're going to see more of that. And you see, Mako can indeed lightning generate lightning. And we even find out that he can redirect lightning. So um, the abilities, these kind of I suppose, more secretive um, bending abilities are becoming more widely known in Republic City and so on. And he, uh, we see Mako thinks that Bolin has uh, a crush on Core, which we find out that he does. And we see the kids are bending, and Quar getting the uh, light on your feet, be the leaf type of thing. Correct. And then I Iki just has the, the biggest mouth in the whole show. It's just like Mako's about <laughs> four feet away from Quar, and they're still talking about how big of a crush she has on Mako. And we still see how kind of blunt and like uh, short with them Cora Mako is here. He's like, just comes, have you seen him? No, and he's about to leave. And she wants to kind of spend more time with him. Hey, cool guys. So it's like some interesting, like good dialogue here um, from the two characters here. And they kind of really get to know each other for the first time here because, you know, they're, they're teammates, but... Um, We've seen more of the friendship between Korra and Bolin in the earlier episodes, and then it's kind of Mako and uh, Korra's relationship developing here. Obviously, the Zuko statue was just there. Bolin usually hangs out in front of the, uh, the Zuko statue. And then Scucci, he's a really interesting character. Um, Again, the only time we see him, but really um, well voiced and a kind of well thought out character in that uh, he plays this role so well as the kid on the street who knows the stuff, but gives it to you for the right price. And just the way he's like the voice actor does it, flash some serious cat, just like overloading Mako with information. The dollar getting out of it and runs off. Yeah, the turf war, something we don't really see that much of uh, mentioned in the show, and um, in the end, it's kind of in this episode, it is the turf war is kind of ended, I suppose, a bit by the equalists, and um, kind of showing their strength in that in the middle of a turf war, they just enter the city and take out these um, these all these triads like multiple triads who have muscled up for a turf war and the equalist just strolled in and beat them. Pabu and uh, Naga meet and are friends instantly. Same sort of thing with Mako, uh, uh, not Mako, Momo and uh, Appa from the original series. And here's a nice contrast between um, Mako, cautious, you know, just qu quietly up core and she just walks up, boom, doors down. And Mako just kind of peeks his head in the door. It's like interesting contrast in personalities. Um, Mako kind of likes to think about things a lot more, and Korra prefers to just do them. And here we see what's happened. Then um, the powerful triads have been captured by the Equalists, and we're really seeing. You know, the fir this is the first time we've we've seen the Equalists apart from that protester guy, the actual fighting Equalists. And our first kind of real kind of action scene in relates to the story, you know, Korra versus the Equalist anti-bender revolution here. And you know, the music suits this kind of different type of chase scene compared to the original show so well. You know, they're on motorbikes, they've got a truck there. Korra does some really, you know, amazing earthbending there. Tachi had him, but the guy just goes off it like a ramp. That's kind of clever choreography in a kind of so a scene, a type of scene that really Avatar has never really done. It's using vehicles that much. Um, in terms of a chase scene, you know, we've had fight scenes vehicle on vehicle, but a chase scene is um, well done here. And then it's interesting to note, um, you know, this is uh, Mako and Korra versus two e two uh, chi blockers, um, and to see the contrast between here and where Korra and Mako go, and um, 
just how they develop their fighting style to adapt to these equalists is uh, interesting as well. Your core gradually goes from losing to one chi blocker to being able to take down a couple with help from Lin in like episode 6 to not having much trouble with them unless they're in huge numbers near the end of the season. It's a nice kind of power kind of pro progression in terms of them adapting to this new kind of style. And in the end, it's only Naga and like the power of this massive polar bear dog that beats um, the Equalists. And Korra has never encountered Chi Blockers before, we see here. That's, she, she's not aware of that chi blocking has gone from being, you know, a thing like that only the Tyli assault the Kyoshi warriors and gone from there to being widely known kind of by groups in the city. Her kind of sheltered um, upbringing as the avatar. And we see kind of Korra really gets on, becomes friends with Mako here by just putting in the same effort that he puts in to find his brother and for her to find her friend. And then really clever writing here, you know, reference back to the first episode, Korra and you know, equalist protester in the in the park, and they're gonna wait for him to see. Does he know what's happening? It's cleverly done, and we really get some more nice scenes between Kor and Mako here. Obviously, like honest question, and we get more 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 about their past and like Kor very kind of black and white in terms of the um, like good and evil sort of thing she doesn't understand that like as Mako says there they were out on the street on their own they did what they had to do to survive and she's really learning a lot through every experience in this city and then like the we'll find out that like there's there's a growing list of pe people hurt by firebenders kind of as this um, show goes on and even into um, Avatar: The Last Firebender, so many um, characters hurt by firebenders. They don't have the best uh, reputation, and just this is a really nice moment between the two. They wake up kind of next to each other, head on shoulder, and it's just like ah. Oh. Core the most kind of uh, awkward with it because oh she she hasn't really been in her kind of romantic relationship. And like this is the kind of big thing that shows um what Tarlock was to, is go go goes on to talk about in like episode eight, that she uses her bending power to kind of not well not it's not oppressing people, it is to kind of intimidate non benders here. Instead of just like asking the guy the she uses her bending to get what she needs here. And it goes to show kind of how cleverly written the whole show in the end is. And the strength of Korra again there, just one hand lifting that guy up right off the ground. And again there's this thing, the revelation tonight, Amon's going to be there. The, the protesters guy's favorite word of course is oppression. So. <laughs> Funny. We see a bit of detective work here, and like, did you see Cora in the background with the one piece of paper, kind of zooming in on it, like in out, while Mako's looking at multiple pieces of paper. It's like, Cora, what are you doing? Maybe if I look closely, I don't know. Maybe if I look far away, and then Mako just puts them all together easily. And again, it's a really cleverly done kind of thing with the flyers and them locating it. And we get to see the kind of first, not the first, some of the first kind of main 
things showing that, yep, they're probably going to be a <laughs> relationship in the show. Um, Cora, the one to like start this and to, to, to come up with the idea of going in as a couple. Interesting. The shippers went wild at this point. And we see the doorman here, the design based off Bill Rinaldi, who works on um, the show Cora, obviously. And then this music, you know, starts up uh, the kind of equalist revelation music. It's really interesting. And then the sheer amount of people here that are supporting the anti mender revolution is insane as they walk in here. Cora has probably never experienced anything like this. Her first experience with an anti bender thing was obviously meeting that protester guy, and now just she's in a whole warehouse full of people. And here we see Amon for the only the second time, but the first time we're really gonna get to know him. And the big thing here is that we see how good of a public speaker Amon is and how he can easily get people on his side compared to Cora who struggled to public speak but kind of was getting getting into her flow when she talked about being the avatar. And we see Amon um, cleverly uses a story and what what turns out to be a, a disguise that he himself was injured by a bender. He uses this to get people on his side, using a story from his past, wearing the mask, and it, it's just a cleverly constructed um, what turns out to be kind of plan just to get uh, power in the city. It's um, interesting. And it's really interesting looking back on these episodes and r really listening to these speeches with where Noah Talk comes from in that it was just, it, it's not in that it was his father, Yukon, and what he did to the two kids, Tarlock and Noah Talk, when they find out they were benders, in that their lives changed completely when that happened. And he thinks that because of that, that um, benders have... Um, ruined the world as it will happen then um, and why he's so anti vendor here despite being a bender himself and we see that the spirit stuff is completely made up lots of theories going around the place when this episode originally aired but um, this is one of those episodes that is so completely different and interesting to look back on once you've seen the first part of the show and then Korra knows nothing about energy vending, having not connected with the previous avatars, or not many people knowing about energy vending. And especially then you get that it was Noah Talk's obsession with this ability that took away his father's um, bending, obsession with this ability that the avatar had that pretty much started him on this quest to gain a power like that and be as powerful as the avatar. And then he hates the avatar, obviously, because the avatar is like the big person to big player for benders. Lightning Bolt Zolt, the leader of the triad, the main triad, he is like the perfect person to show how much power the revolution has in that, um, you know, his group can take, can get the lead, can easily capture the leader of a uh, the most powerful bending triad. And then without actually fighting him, can just easily beat him with no bending. And there we go. He, oof. Interesting looking back on this in that this is actually water bending, just blood bending um, on lightning bolts old here to take his bending away. Nothing to do with energy bending and goes to show how cleverly written the show was because I don't think anyone ever expected that it would be bloodbending. There was crazy theories about Amon being a robot, Amon being a spirit, Amon being able to energy bend and so on, going around the place. And then we come back to how good of a public speaker he is and how well this um, revel revelation is going to help to uh, improve his cause, get more people onto his cause.
And the fact that uh, Mako returns that favour, they're really on the same page. He's not kind of talking down to her as he was earlier on in the episode. Shows how much they have kind of developed as friends, and maybe a bit more than that in this episode. It's really well done. And here the doorman comes back, and we're going to see pretty much for like the first time Korra using just hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the music here, just absolutely amazing. Just the way it builds up as if they cut back between Bolin on stage, uh, Mako waiting for Korra. Korra putting this plan into action, it's amazing. It's just so well done. Yeah, and then we see Korra uses this scarf, which means so much to Mako to uh, fight the doorman. It's really interesting. And you know, just uh, this music track, The Rally, is just, it's probably my favorite track in the whole score from Avatar The Last Airbender. And, you know, just that, that scene there of uh, Bolin being on stage with Amon, he doesn't even attempt to fight back. He knows that, at this stage, he has no confidence in that, in being that he's just completely kind of scared, petrified. And the only thing he can kind of resort to is kind of Bolin's own charm that he actually has, as we saw with him and Korra. And we see how just not good at this whole kind of being a kind of hero fighting like <laughs> villains that um, Bolin is. Um, Mako kind of fits into it really easily here. Korra is perfect for it, but Bolin not at all. And we see the lieutenant fight for like the first time with the Kali sticks. Showing how acrobatic he is, and then Bo Bolin using a really like pro bending based earth bending style there, making discs, throwing them, and then when they miss, he just goes straight for the defensive barrier. It's um interesting contrast of the styles here. It's um well then showing that not just Amon uh, and that pretty much everyone involved in the Equalist can beat Benders and uh, how big of a task it's going to be for Korra and the other Benders to face him on in this group. And it's just how kind of desperate everything is here, the whole escape. Um, you know, they're getting beaten and Korra manages to like knock out the lieutenant for a minute. They just barely escape as they're and like, and Amon, very clever here, there's no need to pursue her, she's going to tell everyone what they need to know, and because it comes from the Avatar, it's going to have even more impact than him publicly revealing himself to the city. It's um, really clever from Amon, and really shows how good of a villain he is, and going to be kind of a main antagonist he's going to be. And then Korra, Korra's worry here, you can sense it in her uh, voice. And her kind of fear, it's not fully developed yet as she's still kind of processing it, but you can definitely sense that um, that she's really concerned about this um, revelation. <laughs> nice pun, but um, how much this is affecting her. And even, and even Tenzin, who usually doesn't kind of react to this sort of thing, is just, wow, only the Avatar had that ability. It's really well done. And the Revelation is actually probably one of my favourite episodes of um, Korra when it comes down to it. Um, episode 10 is probably my favourite, um, but after that it's probably the Revelation. Um, I just think the the speech from Amon, the whole ending section in the rally is just so well done, as is the fight afterwards. And even the characterization moments at the start with Mako, Korra, and even Bolin in this episode. It's really well done. So thank you for listening to this episode of commentary. I'll be back next week with the one for episode 4, The Voices in the Night, or A Voice in the Night. Um, so thank you, and bye. <laughs>